Insight for Creativity is proud to be presenting a video of the New India Lecture Series featuring John Chambers, founder and CEO JC2 Ventures, Chairman Emeritus Cisco. This was organized on Wednesday, September 26, 2018. After a welcome speech by Ambassador Sandeep Chakraborty, John was introduced by Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, Chandra Babu Naidu. Later on, he sat down for chat with Diane Brady, who is also co-author of the book with him, Lessons for Leadership in a Startup World, Connecting the Dots. This conversation was followed by interactive Q&A session. It's a new India lecture. We are indeed honored and delighted that Honorable Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, Shri Chandrababu Naidu is with us here today. Please give him a warm round of applause and welcome him. He is here because of his personal friendship with our speaker today, Mr. John Chambers. I will uh, break with tradition and not uh, introduce uh, John Chambers today uh, because uh, Honorable Chief Minister will be talking about him. But uh, I would take uh, the opportunity to first thank uh, USISPF and State Bank of India for partnering with us in this uh, series of lectures. Today, uh, John Chambers will be in conversation with uh, Diane Brady, and the topic of the conversation is his latest book, I will not get into the details because uh, the conversation will reveal uh, all these exciting things that John is talking about in his new book. Uh, Diane Brady is an award-winning writer, author, and media advisor who, frequently, who is frequently asked to interview newsmakers and speak about global business trends at events worldwide. Along with being a bi-weekly contrib bi contributor to BBC's World Business Matters, she works with a global network of partners to help clients create high-impact content and conversations from op-ed articles and special reports to events and new media products. Connecting the Docs, the book that uh, John is going to talk about today, which uh, she co-wrote with John, former Cisco CEO, is a second book. Her first fraternity was named one of Amazon's best books of the year and has been optioned for a movie. Ladies and gentlemen, please join hands to welcome Dan Brady onto the stage. I have now the honor and the privilege of uh, requesting Honorable Chief Minister to uh, come on stage. I, I couldn't think of a more appropriate person to, to talk, uh, uh, to introduce John Chambers today because uh, John Chambers is an ideas man and our Chief Minister is a man who implements the ideas. I think that is the connect which, uh, uh, which uh, has transformed uh, Andhra Pradesh, previously the undivided state of Andhra Pradesh, and now it's transforming uh, the bifurcated state of Andhra Pradesh. Sir, please come uh, onto the stage. Thank you. My dear friend, John Chambers, I know him for the last 20 years, more than two decades. His Excellency, I Commissioner in New York, respected Danny Brady, dignitaries and friends. It is a very rare opportunity to introduce a great personality, Mr. John Chambers. This book also, if you see, Connecting the Dots, Lessons for, short, for Leadership in a start, in Startup World. You know very well, he is going to change the world now for millions of startups, not one or two. That is the biggest inspiration. I am working with him as a well-wisher for the last 20 years because in India, nobody used to work in technology continuously with persistence. I strongly believe technology will change the total 
world, it will bring transparency, accountability, and also speediness. Earlier, I, I had an opinion, those who will adopt technology, information technology, they will have an advantage, competitive edge. Today, you want to achieve anything, it is possible. Third, industrial revolution is information technology. Fourth, industrial revolution, information technology with internet. With internet plus artificial intelligence. If you see the deadly combination, you can change, you want to achieve anything, it is with you, you can achieve. In that, he has written an excellent book, Connecting the Dots. If you promote startup culture, then automatically you can do wonders. I strongly believe that too is an inspirational leader. In Cisco, he has done wonders, and also now he is doing very good work in creating, if you see his awards also, long back, CNN's top 25 most influential people, Time magazine, 100 most influential people, Clinton Global Citizen Award, U.S. State Department Top Corporate Social Philanthropy Award, and also Harvard Business Review, the 100 best performing CEOs in the world. If you see, if you mention CEO, consistently he created a history. Sometimes one or two years, one CEO will come and will go. But in the recent times, at least two decades, he has, a, he has given a meaning for CEO. But in politics, I am very happy. We are both of us are the same age. I born in 1950, he born in 1949. I am watching him. Even some of the universities, my daughter-in-law got degree. At that time, I attended convocation. You were the keynote speaker. All youngsters, they are very happy. That is the inspiration he has given. He has ignited millions of brains. I am very happy for that. So in this very good occasion, I am very happy to introduce him. This book is going to create history. He has written so many books, but he has created so many histories. Now I am having one request for him. That request is, he has to create startup culture in Andhra Pradesh. Our people are very creative. If you can come and give two, two to three times some lectures. Now with your uh, dynamism, I am very happy. Our people will learn and then they will do wonders. That is my request on this auspicious occasion. He's a very good friend of India. I have seen him. He has created US-India Strategic Partnership Forum. He worked as chairman. Always he believes India's growth and also India's strengths. Whenever I talk to him, he, he is very fond of India's development also. I'm very happy for that. I really appreciate him. With his cooperation, even for Andhra Pradesh, combined Andhra Pradesh, we had so many advantages. Now I'm the chief minister for new Andhra Pradesh. I'm expecting his help for doing better things. Both are having some commonalities. He worked in information technology in Cisco, and now he is working now how to promote startups in a big way. That is uh, what he's going to do. Now he has created founder of JC2 Ventures. Creating a venture capital is one. 
personality like john chambers creating venture capital is another he will be the he will be the best according to me mentor by using his name or by associating with him so many people are going to get so many ideas i don't have any doubt about it today world is very interesting world if you are having any knowledge then you have to go for further innovation then use information technology as a platform for scaling for execution and at the same time use iot as extension go for artificial intelligence if you can go artificial intelligence then automatically you will get so much of strength and then artificial intelligence with manual intervention it is a deadly combination that is the order of the day in future this is where i am saying anything in this world it is only imagination earlier who used to read books in fiction now all these books who wrote on fiction it is a reality now so i am very happy to introduce him and i wish him all the best he is going to create a history in the near future as and today he has served on corporate world now he is going to create startup culture not only in america all over the world i wish him all the best this will be a you can name it as a bible for startup world it will be bhagavad gita in hinduism it is a quran for muslim culture also for all startup people it will be like that once if they read then they can start startup then they will be successful that is going to happen i am very happy i am assuring him just now he has given a copy to me my best friend i am going to read word to word i am going to create startup culture in andhra pradesh it is going to help for future generation with this i am thanking you thank you thank you one and all i can't think of a nicer way to be introduced tonight thank you. i will never let you down thank on you. the friendship thank you my honor sir thank you thank you thank you the chief minister was speaking about how the first real launch of the book was in india and it was interesting to see just the amount of passion and respect that you had for the country then and it was returned and i think it's just very nice to sort of the circle coming back here talking to the USISPF so thank you very much and i want to start what i loved i learned a lot from this book and this is a very going to be a very inclusive conversation we definitely want to include audience questions but you talk a lot about game changers and game changing opportunities for countries i want to start with something personal about um, a game changing opportunity for you if you look back on your career what do you think was a real pivot point very often it's easy when you talk about a pivot point that made the difference in your life you make the mistake of talking about your successes and it would be easy to talk about being with IBM and mainframes and Wangler laboratories and mini computers and with Cisco and growing from literally 400 people to 75,000 people in the company and 70 million in sales to 48 billion but i actually think it's something that each of us learn in life it's not how you handle your successes that are important it's how you handle your setbacks how many of you have kids in the room you don't worry about your kids about when they make good grades or they score a goal in soccer uh, that's nice but you worry when they have their first real challenges their first real setback and you would almost do anything as a parent to help them through that and so i think we're more a product of how we handled our challenges than our successes so actually it may surprise you uh dealing with dyslexia and learning to overcome that in terms of learning disability with the help of a teacher taught me the confidence to deal with challenges in life in ways that many people might have been hesitant and then getting knocked down in 2001 hard mm -hmm. and the dot com era and yet coming out of it even stronger than any other company uh i would say those would be two of the most important learning curves in my life 
let's tell people why you decided to do a book. Because you had, you could have been kept busy. You had many, many things to do, including your role here. What made you decide to want to put your thoughts down now? Well, I thought a book would be something somebody could write about a person or myself after I was dead. And then they're more likely to say it's nice things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, several of the people that I trusted a lot were watching what I was trying to do with startups. And as I met with startups in New Delhi or uh, Dubai, uh, Dubai or in Silicon Valley or in Texas or in New York, the questions were remarkably the same. The challenges were. And so often people knew how to get good ideas, but they didn't know how to scale a company. They didn't know how to translate ideas into vision and strategy, how to build a leadership team, how to communicate in a world where communication is a must, whether it's a political leader or a business leader or a startup. And then how do you take elements like culture mm -hmm. that are so important to a company's success or not, or a country's success, and bring it to life? So while Shannon and I tracked over 280 questions that we were getting regularly, it came John's down to about 25 of them. Uh, that we saw repeatedly. And at that time, several of the people I respected the most said, John, you need to write a book to be able to do this on scale. And when I go to India, I might meet with three or 400 startups, or when I go to France, 200. But if you write a book, you're able to say, here are some of the lessons learned, not looking to the past, but looking in terms of the opportunities and challenges for the future, which there'll be both, and to do it on a larger scale. So it's really the foundation, and in the book, I refer many times to my belief in India, uh, to the belief of this country being a digital country, having the top leadership, both at the national level and at the chief minister level uh, in the world, and a willingness to use technology to change dramatically the lives of their citizens. India, I think, has the chance to grow the GDP at the fastest rate in the world for this next decade, it's somewhere between seven and 10%. And if it's 10%, think that means you double the per capita income every seven to eight years. And you have leaders who really believe that that is possible mm -hmm. in terms of the direction. So I've built a relationship with India that dates back from the time I started at uh, uh, Cisco and with the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership, it's a tight relationship that, uh, among the two countries that I think are most important to our future. So it's a model for where I want to see it go in the startup community. You know, at its heart, you think a lot about leadership. I mean, some people in Silicon Valley, you know, come to it as engineers. They've created technology. You really think a lot about how do you lead people, how do you manage people, and you write a lot about leaders you admire in the book, one of whom is Prime Minister Modi, and I'm curious, when you think about what it was that stood out about him, you know, because your relationship with India predates him, can you give me some sense of, you know, what it was you saw in him? A lot of people come with bold aspirations. Not everybody executes on it, but I'd love to just hear a little bit about that first. Well, it's fascinating because uh, when he got elected and I first started to follow him, I realized he outlines a vision and a strategy. And he outlines, and he does that himself. And he then breaks it down into the actionable areas that have to move. And then he's fearless in the implementation. And you saw that, whether it's on demonetization, and you saw it in the goods and services tax, et cetera. And so when I got asked to be the chairman of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, at that time Business Council, mm -hmm. I at first said no, and then I thought, what am I doing? This should be the model for the most strategic partnership between two countries in the world, not on trade, as it was started 45 years ago, but transforming each country. And so the ability to see that. You see it in Chief Minister Naidu. We've been friends for 20 years, but he outlines a vision for his state, and he's a dreamer like I am. And then he says, here are the elements that have to make that dream come true. And then he is fearless in going after it. So it is the leadership in India that I believe in and a leadership that I think will be the fastest growing economy in the world for the next decade that will be inclusive of 1.3 billion people. And rather than India being a very slow follower and not known for innovation, I believe that India will lead in innovation and be a model for the world on the speed of change. 
And I think the U.S. and India can learn a lot from each other in this process. So to be a small part of that is exciting. So when you think about, and I do want to get into some of the favorite chapters and such, but when you think about the U.S. India, does the startup culture look very different? I mean, obviously, there's what Prime Minister Modi's doing with digitization, what's happening here. Americans like to think we lead the world in this stuff because of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. How do you see this playing out for these two countries? Well, if I can break it into two pieces, yeah. your question. The first part is when I talk to, I know the Chief Minister has to leave at this time for a flight. When I talk to the, uh, thank, thank you, my you friend. Thank you very much. It's an honor. <coughs> when I talk to the startups in India and talk to the startups in Silicon Valley and start to talk to the startups in New York, there's a common theme. It's about people who have a great education and ability to dream. And so it may surprise you that out of the startups I've invested in, over half of them are led by first or second generation Indians. That's here in the US. And so you see a common theme, whether I talk to the startups in New Delhi and I listen to them with a little bit different accent on mm -hmm. English, or Silicon Valley, uh, they have the common views. So I don't think we're different at all in terms of that aspect. I think in terms of speed of movement, in terms of our countries, India has done a better job of outlining a vision for the future of their country and how this will affect each of the key citizens there. And I like very much the Prime Minister's vision of digital India. To the second part of your question, however, we in America think that we lead in innovation and that we're the startup country in the world. That was true a decade ago or two. We used to get 90% of the venture capital went into the US 20 years ago. 80% 10 years ago, it's only 50% today. And we do not have a plan in America for startups or for digitization. So I think this is one we could actually learn from India on what we can do together uh, in terms of this process. And one of the things Makesh and I believe in doing at the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum is saying how do we create that environment where business and government and citizens can work to our goal that benefit the citizens of each country. You know, it's, um, I think there's a lot of thoughts about disruption these days, and it was interesting, the debate around how we started the book, and we decided to start it in West Virginia. Why was that important to you? What was it emblematic to you of starting it in your home state? Well, we learned a lot from each other during this process. She is an amazing writer, Arthur, and she taught me early on, the way you get messages across is to tell a story. And then I kind of combined it with, I love telling stories, but at the end of the chapter, let's give the cliff notes on the key elements of the story. The and playbook. so we came together, the playbooks that occur. And I started in West Virginia because I have tremendous pride for my home state. Uh, but it was a state that was on top of the world uh, you know, when I was first growing up there, chemical center of the world with FMC and Carbide and DuPont, the coal center of the world, very high per capita income, more millionaires than the U United Kingdom had. And yet we lost our way mm. and the state got disrupted. And I learned early on, you either disrupt or you get disrupted. And there is no entitlement to any state or to any country. And so it taught me how to do that. And then I taught the lessons that my parents taught me on learning, and learning to deal with challenges, and learning to deal with fear. And when I almost drowned at six years of age, and uh, my dad saw me get swept off into the rapids fishing, and he ran down yelling at me to hold on to the, hold pole. On to the pole. And I didn't understand why he wanted me to do that, but it wasn't a very nice pole, and it wasn't very expensive. And, but if he was concerned about the pole, obviously I was not going to drown. And so each time I popped up in the rapid water, I'd get a breath of air and I could see him running down the side of the river in the shallows looking for a spot to come and get me. So I didn't panic. And then when he came out and got me and pulled me out of the water, we sat down and we talked about what had happened. And he talked to me about how you deal with fear and how everyone will find themselves in challenging situations. And when you do, you've got to know you can't ignore fear mm. because it's natural, but you have to control it. And so I needed to go with the rapids and then look for the spot to get out because my next time my dad may not be there to get me out. And it taught me how to deal with that. And it's those stories that you learn to tell others. 
And so when I faced my challenges in 2001 with the dot-com bust, I referred back to that situation. It's about dealing with your natural fears, but dealing with the world the way it is, and then saying, how do you plot your path through this 100-year flood uh, that was occurring to our the industry? The dot-com crash. And yeah. we came out of it stronger than any other company in our industry, although it was very painful. You know, one of the things I learned a lot from John in this book, including staying calm in a crisis, because uh, I'm a piece of work to work with, which is good and bad, but it is the power of the playbook. And I think it's actually, it's not process, it's very much, you know, best practices and synthesizing those best practices for others to use. And so I'd love to hear you talk about that concept a bit more and maybe apply it to even the, the role that you're in now. We're in perilous, you know, economic times. What advice do you have? Is there a playbook for U.S.-India relations right now? So, you know, when you think about the best practices, what would you suggest? So where, da where Dan is leading me is to share with you for almost everything I've learned to do in life, I've learned to develop a replicatable process and a playbook that goes with it. And I used to consider that bureaucracy, and boy, was I wrong. Because what allows you to move with tremendous speed is the playbook that you execute off of. And a playbook can allow us to have a strategy for how you acquire companies. Now, I acquired 180 of them, and 12 of them over a billion dollars in cost. And we did it better than anybody in the industry. And every, I think, company in high tech would agree with us on that. And in an industry where 90% of them fail, two-thirds of ours were successful. And we knew that we'd get criticized for the one-third mm -hmm. that was not, but that was part of a portfolio play. We did the same thing with startups. When I look at startups, it's a playbook that I implement for a startup that catches a market in transition, both business model and technology model. A CEO who is world-class and exciting to be around mm -hmm. and wants to be coached and knows what she or he knows and what they do not. Customers who tell me this is the company you ought to invest in, and uh, a team and a board that really I think can help them be successful. So that power of the playbook becomes very, very key. And what uh, Mukesh and Gaurav and Nidhi and the rest of the team are doing with US India Strategic Partnership Forum, we're developing a playbook not for the last 45 years looking backwards to lessons learned in trade, because the 500 billion in trade will come. We're looking at a model going forward for how do you create a startup organization that captures the imagination of every state in India and every state in the US about what our countries could do together that would benefit every citizen. And the ability in part to give back and to nurture new startups, not just focus on big companies where the majority of the job creation will come in the world. And so getting that playbook and then fine tuning it, running it at a faster and faster pace. And one of the things I do want to compliment uh, Mikesh, your team, is you are truly a startup, but how far you all have come this last year has been amazing, something we're all very, very proud of. You know, it's to go from a role where you are, I think it was 75,000 employees, you're the CEO, um, you know, VIP treatment everywhere, which you still, I'm sure you still get, still deserve, but you, to transition from that role to essentially being a startup yourself, an advisor, Give me some sense as to sort of what that transition's been like and how has it altered your, your relationship? How has it evolved even the relationship with this organization? Um, more time, perhaps, yeah. but does it change your mindset at all, sort of being away from a CEO role? Well, one of the things I didn't realize is when you had 75,000 people helping you, how much they really were helping you. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you get on an airplane, I'm looking for my briefing book, and I'm looking for who's going to pick me up at the location, and where are my briefs on each person, and, and what are the political leaders I'm making, et cetera, and there's just me and Shannon doing this. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a little bit of getting used to, but actually, I love it, because I'm only doing things now that I really want to do and that I care about and passionate about, and I'm going to try to build a billion-dollar company with less than 10 people, currently only three, and a company that not only is financially successful, but does a great job of changing the world one more time. I had the opportunity to do that with the internet, I now have a chance to do it in a startup world. And so I'm, I'm more excited than ever before. I've, it's the most fun time I've had in the last 10 plus years. And uh, it's different, but it actually is, I can say and do what I want now. 
and I can be very candid in ways that perhaps CEOs of large companies cannot. And you were a very candid CEO. I mean, you were more candid than many of your peers. And I'm curious, why, when you look at leaders today, business leaders, don't even have to do it today, take it when you were CEO of Cisco, you were more engaged in politics, you were more engaged in policy, you've always been involved in groups like this. Why is that important and why are so many people shying away from it? You know, no, people sure. are kind of hesitant to speak A series of questions. Days. When I came to Silicon Valley, uh, I realized the tremendous creativity that went on, but we never spent any time in Washington. Uh, we viewed Washington as bureaucracy and government, and the further the where they, they were away from us they were, mm -hmm. uh, the better. And if we did go to Washington, we went in to explain to the political leaders, both Democrats and Republicans, they weren't doing things right, and we flew back out, mm -hmm. which is the worst of all worlds. And John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins and I formed TechNet uh, that represents 80 of America's top tech companies to say that has to change. How do we work toward a win-win environment uh, in Washington and throughout the world? And we did that very well. Over 20 years, we never had a major issue, including the times when you had Snowden, the issues about technology being misused both in America and around the world. And yet, because we built the trust, we navigated through that very smoothly. I do worry to the indirect part of your question that Silicon Valley has to be very careful. We're coming across arrogant to the rest of the world, and we're coming across out of touch to our job destruction that we're doing with technology into the very legitimate needs of government to say how do we work together on key areas. So I'm hoping this leadership will take it to the next level and that many of us who've seen this movie before can perhaps share best practices as you move forward. Now I want to take questions from the audience. I could keep asking John questions and he's heard me ask him questions for uh, many months. So if you have questions, just raise your hand. We have one here and just please introduce yourself as well. And uh, do, we have a, do we have a microphone? By, we do, yes. To be recorded for posterity. Thanks so much. You know, one of the things I enjoy doing with my startups is teaching the young CEOs how do they handle questions. And the first question you get from the audience is the most important. And I've found that as that question gets asked, if you walk off stage and you remind the person who's asking the question, it's the most important question I get, and the last one is the same. And as you get closer, it's hard for them to ask you a really tough question. <laughs> and so you get close to them, and then, then you ask, what is on your mind, sir? Oh and so goodness. I teach my young CEOs to do the same. You are hypnotizing me now. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I heard very nice things about you, sir. It's a great honor to meet you today. Thank you. Thanks to the Honorable Khans. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, I, I'm in private equity. My name is Mahesh Saladi. Yes. One of the problems I really see the, for the youngsters and the startup companies, especially connecting the dots, they think that like it's a disruptive technology. Yes. But by the time they come to the market, find either an ultimate customer or a, a venture capital investor, by the time the technology changes so rapidly. And uh, I think there is a need for hand-holding organizations or associations or even private businesses to take them to the next step where they can introduce to the market very quickly and really just grow fast. Um, what kind of suggestion and what kind of uh, advice you are giving it. So I hope I, it's not a tough question though. I think you, no, it's not personal at all. And you can ask me, there's no, I don't think there's a question you could ask me that I wouldn't answer very transparently. But it's a very important point because the startups in India are very good. You have probably the top graduates in the world, 600,000 of them out of IIT schools and others. Uh, and they come up with very good ideas. However, they don't have the ability to scale as quickly as they need to in India. And very often, even the VCs who are very good don't have the experience with how do you go to market, how do you do channels, how do you grow globally. And so I think one of the things, if we're really going to scale the startups in India, uh, that we have to do more effectively is how do we help them through that transition. And part of that is in the book about channels and how you grow. And I think it's something that I've talked with both the venture capitalists in India and some of the US, such as IDG, et cetera, and some of the US players like a sale on how do you do it in your sales. And this is what I do with my startups. I try to say, here's how you open channels, here's how you grow. The difference is a startup, if you don't have sustainable differentiation, you aren't going to be in business, you're not going to survive. 
once you get that differentiation, though, you've got to scale quicker. And my worry today is especially not necessarily for the consumer startups in India, but the business to business, they have to come to the US to get a larger market. And I'd like to see India, the large businesses in India, open up more to these startups and then also get a replicatable process for how they also get access to the US market, US market as they grow. And I think you've identified one of the key challenges is there aren't the role models that have done this that can kind of help them through this. And very often the venture capitalists can get them started but can't accelerate at the time they need in terms of go to market. So it's a challenge that I think we face together and one I would be honored to help help be a part of the solution. Thank you. Uh, John, my question is that, uh, you know, over the last few years we have seen startups uh, really coming up all over the world and a lot of encouragement. But another trend that we see is these mega corporations, you know, they are buying and acquiring companies and they are having, like recently there was this news of four companies having a more than trillion dollar market capitalization. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you see in the future? Because somehow I sometimes I worry that these mega corporations, uh, they, they will keep on acquiring startups and they become so big and they will have economies of scale and they will not really allow creation of jobs and sometimes maybe uh, inhibit creativity. So if you look into the future, what, what, what if you do some crystal ball gazing, what, what do you see? How will, be the, how will the world look? Do you see it populated by millions of startups? or there will be a few thousand big companies ruling over the world. What is your view? My view that you've got to have a startup community that grows and grows well to really do innovation on scale. And no matter how good a company is, as they get bigger, it's harder to innovate with the speed that is needed. Uh, I think you're realizing that many large companies are saying that I need to partner with startups because that's where the best and brightest in India or the best and brightest in the U.S. are going into. And suddenly you have relationships that scale across this, much like one of my startups, Spark Cognition, with 220 people in artificial intelligence, partner with Boeing to design the next AA, FAA uh, architecture for unmanned aircraft. So Boeing, as innovative companies it gets in America, said I need to partner with a startup to do this. I also believe, on this role I've changed. I love to acquire companies at Cisco. I acquired 180 of them. But once we acquired them, only the engineering group grew after that. We already had legal, we already had finance, we already had sales. And if you're gonna do the job creation of 1.2 million new jobs per month in India, You've got to have many more startups become unicorns and unicorns become large public companies. And so I think it's very, excuse me, I think it's very important that we get the startup engine going and scaling at a much faster pace. And I think it's important for governments to say, how do we make that happen? Okay, I'm, I'm Sundar Vardharaj. I'm a president of a company called Kaiju. Yes. Hi. So what are those characteristics a startup should have to really succeed? What do you look for? Ah. So what are those five or six magic parameters. To get you into JC2. Well, the reason I'm smelling is I've announced one startup in India already with Unifor, and I'm about to announce another one that is even riskier, but uh, uh, with just a world-class young CEO that is fearless and at times doesn't know what he doesn't know. Uh, so I look very carefully for an industry that is in transition and is being disrupted and a startup that is very effective in that business disruption that also has major technology strengths. Every startup in the future, regardless of industry, will be a high-tech startup. Every company will become a digital company, regardless of whether you're automotive or you're finance or healthcare. And so I look for the combination of that business model and technology change together. Then I look very specifically at the CEO. And interestingly enough, both of the CEOs that I've selected to invest in in India, one that I've talked about and one I'll announce here at uh, the end of this next month, uh, they had won a bunch of the major awards in India, and often groups, whether it's IIT or MIT, recognize him as the top five to ten startup companies in India for that. And then I see a CEO who she or he wants to be coached and truly values that coaching much more than the financial investment because my experience is how to scale companies and that I know how to do pretty well and I've got scars from mistakes made along the way that I can teach the young CEO. 
I then look at where their customers are and the customers' view of how good are these startups and why they like them and why they see them being, being very different. Then I look at the investors and leadership team. So it's that innovation playbook that I just run again and again and again. And Shannon will tell you we look at 200 startups a month. Uh, and we get the pick of the litter, literally, of anyone's usually that we want to be a part of. But it's those common replicatable factors that I look at in deciding who I invest in and spend time with. Now, having said that, one of the reasons I wrote the book is so I can do this more on scale. So when I'm in India, I will meet with a number of startups, not just the ones I'm going to be tied to, but venture capital startups with their portfolio or large groups of startups on campuses and saying, what can we do together? Because I love to teach. So you have seen a lot of people succeed and fail. Where do you find most of the young CEOs that you do coach or mentor? Where do they tend to fall down? What are some of the common mistakes they, they make? This may surprise you because startups are known for their speed, but the common mistake they often make is they don't move fast enough. Mm. The other common mistake they make is they don't understand what is their differentiation in the market today and what will be their differentiation three to four years out. Mm. Because if you don't have differentiation, those big companies will roll over on you. And so having that differentiation. The other mistake startups make is they assume because they're wicked smart very often in engineering, they know how to select a good sales leader or a good service leader, and that's usually not the case. Mm. You've got to understand the leader of what you know and what you don't. And because your subject matter expertise in one area does not mean that gut feel carries over to the other. And perhaps the fourth area that I see them making mistakes on is I'm very loyal to the team that helps me be successful. But as you scale an organization, the startups will often stay with one of their founders who can't scale with the organization. And all of a sudden, that loyalty stops that company from growing and actually can cause the company to crash and burn. And so if you address that early and take perhaps your head of engineering uh, who reports to the CEO, often an engineer there as well, and say you're not able to scale, but what you're good at is strategy and architecture. Let me put you into this role and do that early as they start to not be able to scale, then you keep them with you longer term. But what happens way too often is the startup stays with the entire team, and then when they change, they lose the person and perhaps lose their company. Mm -hmm. The question right here, and then we'll go to... Hi, John. Uh, my name is Manu. I'm a former Cisco employee. And, um, Sorry that you're not there now. No, I, I moved on to financial services and merger and acquisitions, so actually <laughs> I got good perspective on both sides of the aisle. Uh -huh. And my question to you really is that I lived through the dot-com bubble just like you did. Yes. Everything was frothy. Um, everything with the dot com was frothy. Do you think that we are hitting a similar situation here? Even though I'm a big believer in startups, tech is a whole bull mm -hmm. area to be in. But the amount of frothiness that is building up, amount of fintechs, insure techs, health techs, everything with the tech in the end, and the valuations being so high anytime you look at a company, do you think that there's a structural problem building up? And if so, do you think there's a structural solution to this that you propose as an industry we should be keeping in mind because they want to live through another dot-com bust either. I actually think that our problem is we don't have enough startups in both the U.S. and in India and that's the structural problem that I'm most focused on and then how do they scale. I think it's important that when companies are private including even the unicorns, those that are private with a billion dollar last evaluation in the private marketplace, uh, you have to realize that a number of them will fail. And if you're in charge of a portfolio or if your child works for a startup, you've got to realize that more than half of them will fail. And what Silicon Valley's learned is when they fail, you get up, dust yourself off, and then you go again. And many of the successful companies often are led by founders that have been through a couple tough, tough approaches on it. Will there be some big, very visible crash and burns? Absolutely. But barring a major change in the global economy, technology will be the requirement for all businesses. And so if you have a portfolio play, then your probabilities of success are pretty good. One thing that was a surprise to me when I studied the most successful portfolios by venture capitalists, though, the ones that had the best returns 
took the most risk and the highest failure rates. Uh, and one or two successes carried the whole portfolio. Uh, I'm trying to do a balance of the two. I'm, I'm much more interested with the majority of my startups being successful, and I measure them not on financial success, but the amount of new jobs they create. And my goal is to see a 40% growth in job creations across my startups in total, which means by definition, the revenue growth has to be over 50%. Uh, percent. And so I have multiple goals here, part of them purely uh, financial, but part of them for society and direction. Long-winded answer to your question, I do not believe we have a structural problem. A economic slowdown, however, will cause problems for all companies. Uh, but you will see a higher breakage uh, in the startups that get a very high valuation too quickly. It's easy to remember that Cisco was 70 million in sales when I joined, and we'd already gone public. When you're a private startup, you often get an evaluation of a billion dollars with only perhaps 20 million in sales, and those will go one way or the other. 12 people. We have a question over here at the woman in the green dress. Uh, uh, yeah, woman in the green dress, and then after here. Hi, I'm Lucinda Sadrian. I used to work at the IFC at the World Bank, and uh -huh. I now raise private debt and private equity for companies in emerging markets. Yes. So um, I really love what you mentioned about impact, society, development. One of the things that I find that so many institutions aren't great at, okay, maybe it's not one of the 200 you look at and you say yes to, but the feedback that you give to a company that's not getting a yes, if you say that not a fit for us because X, Y, and Z, we don't know enough about that industry, we think you know the time has passed for us, but here's three other VC firms or another way for you to maybe market your idea, that those two sentences mean the world and getting to the capital faster. And I'm just curious about your thoughts on giving that feedback to those that don't make it through your funnel. Well, uh, Shannon will tell you, and she's my equivalent of chief operating officer and chief of staff, is that I stay engaged with lots of the companies on a regular basis, even though I've told them I won't invest. And I give them pretty candid feedback about, you know, first, what is your differentiation? Secondly, your elevator pitch on raising money from venture capital isn't very good. You've got to get much quicker, more net in the communications that you've got to be able to say what your differentiation is and you go to market strategy. You're missing on the services piece. And so I've learned, and I kind of consider it tough love, uh, but you've got to be direct, but still caring, and sharing with people where I think their exposures are. If it's an area I really don't know and understand, I just tell them that. If it's an area I know and understand, but it's not one that we're going to go into, then I share with them, here are people they might want to think about doing and the direction. What I have to be careful of, though, is with a staff of three of us and talking to literally hundreds of startups every month, is I can't be as good about the handoffs as I could when I had 75,000 people working for me. But I do believe in the candid feedback, and I've told more than a few startups that if you can't get a differentiation, you're not going to be successful, or that your time to market is too, too large, uh, or that you've got to restructure uh, how you present your company because 10 pages into your slide deck, I still don't understand what you do. And you've got to make it more net and, and approach. But I do give that feedback. I love teaching. I uh, don't misunderstand what I'm saying about that. But I, I have learned to be a little bit more direct with the startups, and I think they value that, especially this younger generation. So we'll take a few more questions. Did you have a question? Is that yet? And, and so I'm sorry, go ahead. Let's switch, uh, switch out the room. Hello, John. Hello. Uh, I'm an IITian myself and uh, went to grad school here, and so I'm a retired executive from at and yes. Intel. Been retired for a while. Um, if one takes a look at many of the companies that have been disruptive in the last 20 years, Amazon, Google, uh, Uber, et cetera, et cetera, they all, they all came into their current I guess success because of internet and digital technology. So they were disruptors based on whatever they did. Where do you expect the next disruption to take place since we already are so mature? I mean, this company is only 20 years old, 
but they're fairly mature. Where do you expect yeah. next disruption to come yeah. since go, you are at that? Uh, yeah. Go through your portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you mean, I think Diane did a very good job of helping me articulate where I look for the disruptions. And I look for the technology uh, market transitions going on around digitization, IoT, cybersecurity, open transparent government, ag tech, uh, customer experience, artificial intelligence in that, and it breaks down into drone companies, defensive drone companies, security companies, etc. I also think that the next generation of disruption uh, will not be done necessarily by the large players. Uh, a 20-year-old company is, is an old company in high tech. And so they've got to reinvent themselves. And it'll be fun to watch how this current generation of leaders, do they reinvent themselves or not? I think we clearly did at Cisco. And Cisco was really the generation of startups built on the internet and realized it would change every aspect of our lives. And we learned how to do acquisitions and partnerships with governments and digitization in a way that others did not. This generation currently is off of social media a lot and off of the applications that go to the consumer in that social media, et cetera. I think the next generation will very likely be around artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing, uh, and using the data gathered from all these endpoints to transform business areas. So I think there's a natural evolution as long as companies have a chance to make money and there's not too aggressive a pricing in an industry that prevents startups from being successful. You know, we always had unbelievably great margins at Cisco, every 65%, and my competitors who came at us in lots of different ways all had very good margins of profits. So we competed more, not could I prevent my competitor from making any money, but more how do we add dramatic value than others. I think that's the right high road for these large companies to do in terms of their marketplace on it. I think we have time for one or two more questions, um, and uh, then we'll give John some closing thoughts over here, I know, and then... And Dan's learned from me, uh, you never ask for the last question. Because if you, don't get the, you, true. if you don't get the question that you're going to end on with the audience, you say one to two more questions. And so that's why you always keep it. Now, no pressure on you, sir. Uh, but if your question's really good, I end the question with you, and then I go to Diane. If, if it's just, just okay, I have to refer to the young lady behind you for the next question. Okay, question for you, John. My name is Ravi Madhotra. Ravi, it's a pleasure. That's not the question. I'm retired from Federal Reserve Bank. Yes. And the question is on the future of globalization. Yes. Uh, from the people point of view, work is a lot closer now because of Facebook and other social media. But the government policies in UK, USA, and other places is moving in the other direction, my country first. So what do you see is the future of globalization? Will it be more? Small scale, people will do things on their own, or government will change their policies? I think it's a great question to summarize on, and thank you. Uh, and it comes back to, I think this is a better world when there's free trade. However, it can't be trade that one country wins on and one company loses, country loses on. And I think where that occurs, and that's why you see the voting patterns in America that, for example, with China, and I'm an expert on China, been there for 37 years. Uh, China, it used to be a win-win relationship, tough negotiations, but in the last 10 years, it's been more of a win-lose versus the U.S. And I think most U.S. companies and citizens understand that. And so when that happens, globalization uh, gets a step backwards. I think it's the responsibility of countries together to create a win-win relationship, not just in terms of trade, but in job creation, and think through how does your partner win in everything you do. It's one of the many things that I admire about India and the leadership in India is that's how your prime minister thinks about it, and that's how the people in this room tend to think about it. When I talk to my counterparts in India, one of the first questions they will ask me is what I usually ask them first. John, how, what can be a benefit to you if we do this? 
And so it's how you build that partnership. And I think after some bumps here, and I do think we'll get through it and get global trade back on track, and it, but it has to benefit both countries, and it has to benefit the citizens in each country. And this is where I think without realizing it, we build up a number of hurdles where the voters in many countries realize this is not a win for them. And so I think we have to address it. But I think we eventually always get it right. And it's where I'm a dreamer that the U.S.-India strategic partnership and Mukesh and Gaurav and Nivi and I are honored to be an integral part of that can be a model for not only how two countries work together, that can be a model for the rest of the world, but also a model for how it benefits every person in every state in each country. And so if you get that models right, and I think the U.S.-India uh, strategic partnership can be that. I think it's the most important partnership in the world for America, and I'd argue it's the most important one for India, with the oldest democracy and the largest democracy. But more importantly, how do we increase the standard of living of citizens in both countries, and how do we do that across the entire country in India and across the country in the U.S.? If that works well, and we can be a model, I think you'll see more and more countries follow that. Does that make sense to people? I think that's an excellent answer. And that is one thing I will say I have very much learned from you. We're living in a time of the politics of fear. I think you're emblematic of the politics of optimism. And as you say, you are a big dreamer. You're a big risk taker. And one of the things I love that John says is that you wish you'd taken more risks, yes. given the choice. So I think that says it all. So please join me first in thanking John Chambers. And thank you, John, very much. And um, thank you. I would like to invite up Consul General uh, Sandeep Chakraborty to give some closing remarks. Thank you, Diane. I think, uh, you know, when we hear CEOs and when they are talking of uh, relations between countries, it somehow makes uh, much more sense to us because uh, they have uh, worked uh, on the ground. They understand how people and environments and ecosystems work. And I just remember you were talking about important relationships. I remember another former CEO who was the former Secretary of State, that is Rex Tillerson. And he said in a speech uh, uh, in October 2017 that the India-US relationship is the most important bilateral relationship for the next 100 years. And I firmly believe what he said because I think coming from the corporate world, he had the understanding. And exactly I, when you were speaking your last words, I was thinking about uh, Secretary Tillerson, what he said. And I found so much of, uh, you know, coincidence and consonance between what uh, you said. Thank you very much, John, uh, for joining us here. And, uh, you know, it was an honor that your old friend, uh, Mr. Chandrababu Naidu, Chief Minister, was here with us. I think he added a flavor which is not very common uh, in the consulate to have a Chief Minister introduce our speaker. And we thank you for coming here. I would request Mr. Satyanarayanan, CEO of State Bank of India, our partner, to honor you with a plaque and uh, the traditional uh, Thank you, my friend. And I would request uh, Mukesh to please uh, present a plaque to uh, Diane. Come, we'll take a I picture. literally am not worthy. Should I come this way? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mukesh. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mukesh. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just join us for a picture. So we don't miss our opportunity for marketing. Let's move over ah. here in front of the U.S.-India Strategic yes, Partnership exactly. chart, and we'll take a couple pictures this way. <laughs> And we'll just put it right over your right shoulder, uh, right between the, the two of you. Leave a little bit. There we go. <laughs> I think that's good money. This is also Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.